What three words would you choose to pray for our church? One of the things we do in the call to prayer is we use this thing called Menti. And I know it's devices. Some people hate it. Some people can't understand what it's about. The, the purpose of it is to enable us to engage and to help you do more than just watch. So I'm going to invite you to get your phones out and to pray with me. And a little bit later, we're going to look at what we create together. But my invitation is for you to choose three words. They don't have to be any of those words. They can be other words. But to choose three words that you would pray for our church. Or if you're a visitor from another church, your church. Or maybe you're visiting from our church and you recognize how much prayer we need, in which case we gratefully receive it. Now, if you're not familiar with what to do with Menti, what you do is one of two things. You can either point your camera at the uh, boxy thing on the right-hand side and it will say menti.com underneath. You press your finger on that and it will take you and invite you to write three words. Or you can Google menti.com and it will ask you to submit a code. That is the red numbers there. If you've got all the numbers down, eyes down, here it goes. 53, 83, 04, and 58. Why am I doing this? Because we need prayer and we want to invite you to pray. And over the next 10 minutes, before we come back to this, just to choose three words that you want. Those are just suggestions. More what? And uh, we'll come back to that. And the code will stay there for a few minutes. We're looking at the book of Nehemiah. We've been doing this for a few weeks. Previous uh, Previous sermons are available on our podcast. If you haven't yet subscribed to iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts, you can listen uh, to help you sleep at night. Uh, My voice will help you do that. Don't uh, do that when you're driving. Uh, Put me on slightly faster and I'll keep you awake as you drive. Um, Or you can watch videos, YouTube, and so on. We're looking at the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived uh, many centuries before Jesus. He was a slave, uh, and uh, he was living hundreds of miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the focal point of his religion, his faith, and of his ancestors. He'd never lived there, but he knew probably his grandparents or his great-grandparents had lived there, and he still saw that as the center of his faith. But Jerusalem had been overrun and uh, not been rebuilt, and uh, it was oppressed because there were no walls. We've talked about this before, but just a reminder, if you have your own house and you have a garden, you will know the importance of a fence or a hedge, or a wall. That if there is nothing guarding your premises, you feel more vulnerable that somebody can walk in and climb in and steal something from you, from your hedge, not your hedge, from your shed, or, or, or whatever. But in those days, walls were absolutely vital for a city to maintain security at night. And Nehemiah hears of the suffering of these people that are, he's, he feels a kinship with, but he's never met them. And he is distressed, and so he begins to pray. For several months, he prays. And we would think that his prayer is that the um, emperor, and I've been practicing his name because I'm not very good with names, the emperor Artaxerxes uh, would do something dramatic. But actually what Nehemiah prays is that Artaxerxes would send him. And the moment arises, and he says to the king, will you send me? And Artaxerxes allows Nehemiah to travel with resources, with backing, to encourage the people to rebuild the walls. Come, let us rebuild the walls, he says. Now, why do they need to do this? Why do they want to rebuild the walls? Well, we talked about the security and the safety that a wall provides. But what's the significance of this city? Why is he traveling all this way to do it? The city becomes synonymous, particularly in the New Testament, the city becomes synonymous with the temple. They're intertwined, and both are the representation of the presence of God. And so to rebuild the city and to, is to rebuild the temple is to enable God to be glorified in that place. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that they were to use the temple and to be safe to worship because there is an external wall around the city. They were to use the temple as a place of worship to God. What does that mean? It means it's to be a place of thanksgiving where they come and they bring their harvest, if you like, once a year, and they say how great God is, but they also come and acknowledge the things they've done wrong in their lives and they ask for cleansing and they ask for repentance and they come and they are reminded to serve and they go out from that place and they bec- it becomes a place of prayer. And that was what the temple was and the temple is facilitated by the, the city around it. It is a refuge, a place to run to, to meet with God and to be safe. It is a place to receive help where the poor and the vulnerable, the fearful and the afraid can go. There is the place, there is the building, there is the city. But if there are no walls, it is no more safe than where you already are. So you might as well stay in the place of danger. So this is an important place to hear and learn from God a place that demonstrates the love of God. So, Nehemiah inspires them. He tells them of the miracle of how he has heard about them and how he's been allowed to come by Artaxerxes. I'm very encouraged and excited to be able to say that correctly. And how he's come all that way. And so we learn in the last talk that they begin this good work. And we might apply that to building a church because there is a parallel. In the New Testament, the city of God, the temple of God are also used as metaphors for the church. We want a a building, we are building a community, a people that glorifies God, that together we become a place of help and care. That is why the food bank is so crucial. As we think about the crisis in Birmingham City Council, Where else do these people go? 250 people a week saying, the only place we know that can help us is the church. It's important to be that refuge. We want to be a place of learning. Hopefully, we are able to help each other Uh, hear and understand scripture and have it change and transform our lives. We want to be a place of thanksgiving. We've done that this evening as Noah has led us. We want to be a, a group of people who encourage each other to look beyond the miserable and up to the glorious. Beyond the things that are not working and not going right and to raise our eyes to the things that God has done and will do. We want to be a people of humility and change who come and say to God, Lord, will you, will you cleanse me? Will you help me be different? Will you help me grow? Will you help me be more like you? And we encourage each other in small groups and praying together to be more like Jesus. We want to be a community of prayer, but we need to build it because we are not as good as we could be. We are not impacting this town as much as it needs us to. We are not transforming lives as much as the darkness of this nation requires. We need to build salvation. We want to save lives people. We want to share the love of Jesus. That's our mission statement, to make sense of life together. We're going to emphasize that word in less than a minute, together, and share the love of Jesus. So the way that Nehemiah begins to build the walls is a really interesting way in which we can build church. And we're going to look at chapter 3. Now, I am not going to read chapter 3 to you, uh, partly because I'm not as clever as Paul, uh, and I can't pronounce all these words. It's taken me three weeks to work out how to say Artaxerxes, and I have no hope with the rest of these names. And also, because quite frankly, this passage has got a lot of names that could, I'm not going to say scripture could be boring, but I am going to say that if I read it to you, you might go, what? 
So I'm going to keep putting it on the screen for you because I want to draw some things out of it. We will start with whoever that guy is, Elisha Hib. Elisha Hib? Elisha Hib. Elisha with a hib on the end. Anyway, this guy, the high priest and the fellow priest, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. That's the gate that the sheep probably went through. He didn't say, it's not my job. He didn't say, I've got a dog collar, I'm religious, I'm prayerful, I stand at the front, I'm not going to get my hands dirty. He probably, if he went to priest college, wasn't trained to build walls. He could have said, that's not me. He could have uh, said, I'm going to be in prayer support, you guys get on with it, I'm going to stand back and let you do it. He sets the tone. We're going to pull up our, 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 roll up our sleeves, pull up our socks. I don't suppose they wore socks in those days. We're going to pull up our tunics and we're going to do it together even though it wasn't his job. And they dedicated it to God. They said, this is yours. We're doing this for you. This isn't our work. This is for you. We are not working for Nehemiah. We're not working for Donald. We're not working for the archbishop. We're working for you, Jesus. That's what it means to dedicate. This is yours. I don't know whether you've built a wall, but it's an odd thing to say this is your wall, God. But that's what they did. So then we have loads of different people's names. I will let you think about how you want to pronounce those. I can do Uriah in the middle, but lots of different people. And they each build a little different part of the wall. And then we find that there were some of them who wouldn't do it. Their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under the supervisor. So there's one or two of the posh people one or two of the little Sutton folks, maybe, who just said, no, nah, not for us. Got me in trouble for that. Scrub that from the tape. <laughs> one or two people who says, no, nah, I'm not going to get involved. We're going to see a little bit later, but some of the nobles do. But there's sometimes people who go, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get involved. And we read on, there were loads of different people. Some of those who, uh, uh, who, needed, who worked on it didn't even live in the city. They, they came to help. They just wanted to help in our, in our idea. They weren't even part of that church, but they came and they got involved and they helped. Uh, so these people were from outside the city, but there are other people, uh, loads of them. There are verses and verses and verses, and they're all going to be on the screen um, the gold, is this the goldsmith? Yeah, the goldsmiths. There wasn't even their skill, their trade. They had a, they had a skill job. They were, probably, they were making good money, probably. But they stopped. They lay out a sign and said, we're going to build the walls. We're going to get involved. Here's one of the rulers, one of the uh, important people, it would appear. He gets involved as well. So the list goes on. Lots of different people were needed. Nehemiah could not build the wall. And it's interesting that the Bible wants to name all these people. And for some cultures, it's really important to see the specificness of this. And it's clear that the Bible wants us to understand this was not done by one or two people. This was done by a load of different people. All ages, women as well, with the help of his daughters. This wasn't a masculine men only macho thing. Some people managed to do more. Uh, it says that they also repaired a thousand cubits of the wall. These guys were really efficient. They did what they did their bit that was odd to them, and they thought, hey, can we do some more? So they did some more. And when we serve and work into building the church, some of us are able to, to do a lot of hours. Some of us are only able to do a handful of things. Some of us are able uh, to achieve an awful lot with the time we've got. Others of us take a long time to get things done. And it's okay. You see this variety. And each one is valued, whether they did one gate or whether they did a thousand cubits of the wall. I love this, the dung gate. It is what it's said on the tin. It's the smelly, pooey gate. 
out of which was taken all the stuff that they shoveled up for the allotments, except they didn't have allotments, all this, the poo that the animals had left, maybe that the humans had left, and they took it out one gate. Incidentally, that was the gate that then uh, went down into the valley that later became close to and a metaphor for hell. Sometimes God asks us to build a church and it's not easy and it's smelly and it stinks and it isn't appreciated and we really wish we wouldn't have to do it. But there are lots of different people. There's a whole load of more people. There's even more people called Nehemiah. There's a different Nehemiah. And there's more. Different people. Different people needed. Different levels of enthusiasm. I love this, that Barak, the son of that guy, is described as he repaired his zealously. Now, does that mean everybody else didn't do it zealously? And he was, or was it, is this sarcasm? Is he saying, well, Zabai was just a bit over keen. Oh, I could build a wall. And he got all excited. Oh, he's the zealous one. He's the inth- I don't know, but it doesn't matter. But some of us love what we do for the church. Some of us may do it at a cost. And it's a sacrifice. But everything is needed. Different levels of enthusiasm. And there's more. We're on to verse 21. Lots of different people building different parts of the wall. And there's more. Lots and lots of different people. It articulates who they were and which bit they were working on. Even more people. We're on now to uh, 30 different verses of people. And we're still going. And we get to the end of chapter 3. What might this say for us? Well, let's just pull it together a little bit and what we learn. If that was a model for how to build church, how to build the city of God, what might we learn? Firstly, that we might be building not just our church. Remember the guys who came from outside? We may be building not just Sutton Baptist, Falcon Lodge Chapel. Once a, once a month, we in, uh, I, I invite other church leaders in Sutton. I say, I'm going to be praying in the church, and other church leaders come, and we pray on the platform here for the building of the kingdom of God in Sutton Coalfield. Lots of you know that I'm involved in supporting other ministers in other churches. Other folks on our staff team help other churches. When we build church, we don't just build Sutton Baptist Church. What else do we learn? We learn that sometimes it's difficult or unpleasant that there was the dung gate. Sometimes what God asks of us is hard and it's costly. We learn that to build the church needs everyone, all ages, all ages. It's a delight to me as I look out, there's all ages. Men and women, young and old, Bald and hairy, it's great. Different workloads, different abilities. We may be able to do a little bit, we may be able to do a lot. It's okay. We get involved, whatever our status, whatever our qualifications, whatever our skills, we play our part. And we do it all as a dedication to God. We build the church. And we may say, but how? How can I build the church? And I want to bear, if it's okay with you, bear repeating stuff that I've said over many times, usually on Renewal Sunday, certainly through living the life. I want to remind you of seven things that we ask you to do, hoping that you can do at least four of them. Many of us, six of them, some of us, seven of them. Before we do that, 
I want to read you a quote from the book we've been uh, reading together, and I want to encourage you to read it. If you haven't yet done that, it's not too late. Go for it. For a funny little story, if you go into Waterstones and you order the book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, the chances are they will say to you, do you go to Sutton Coldfield Baptist Church? Because so many of folks have bought one from them that they, they've picked up on that. Here's a little quote from it where he talks about what is a saint? What is a, how do you describe someone who follows God? And he quotes a guy called a Ronald Price. He says this, A saint is someone who, with however many faults, even crimes, leads by example. Almost never by words. To imagine the hardest of all, the seamless love of God for all creation, including ourselves. What do we ask of you? We ask fundamentally one, no, the seven, but let's go for the first one. Really, really important. You've heard me say it lots and lots of times. You will build this church if you live for Jesus authentically every day of the week. Nowhere near this building. If you live as a person of love, of generosity, of compassion, of mercy, of grace, if you are good to people, and you live such a way that people go, there's something about that person that makes their faith attractive, where do you go for your faith? Oh, I go to Sutton Baptist Church. That is the most significant thing that you can do. And so the joke which I say every time, but it's not really a joke, is that if you decide to be a bigot or judgmental or selfish or lie or in any way hurt other people, could you just not tell anybody that you come here until you've resolved it? Because that is the most damaging thing that you can do for our church is not live it out. How do we build church together? We just gather a group of people who say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to copy him. I want to live like Jesus. So how on earth can we build a church together? We just grab, I don't know, looking out, there's probably about 100, 120, 130 of us in the room, 130 people who live for Jesus probably had, I don't know, something like 300 this morning, so let's put them together, 400, 430, 450 people who say, I'm going to live for Jesus authentically. And if people ask me why, I'll say, because it's what the Bible says, because I learn about Jesus at church. And the second thing we've already talked about, we want to ask you to do is to pray, because we cannot live authentically without the filling of his Holy Spirit. We need him to work among us. If you think this church will just carry on as it is, I'm afraid it won't without us wanting God to move, without us praying. So I want to invite you to go back to your phones and your three prayers, three words for our church, and we're going to whack those up and have a look at the word cloud that they have created, combining this morning and this evening. And what happens is, is that the biggest words are the words that most people have put. And if you want to add to that, because you haven't yet done it, you could put the code 45383-0458. It'll ask you for uh, a code. And there you go. This is our prayer. Whoops. We'll just go back and it will appear in a sec. That's it. If... That's it. Let's pray. Father, we bring this stuff to you. Would you build your church? Would you make us dissatisfied with what we are and hungry for what we could be? Will you pour these things into us. Fill us and give us more love, more wisdom, more peace, more leaders, more resources, more hope, more community, more faith, more wisdom. Would you build your church, Jesus? Would we glorify you? Would we be a place of refuge? A place that people see you in? 
in All Aboard and Little Ark, in Boys and Girls Brigade, in Food Bank, in our relational communities, in our small groups, in Ladies' Fellowship, in Open Door, in everything. Fill us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've got two things. Uh, We invite you to live authentically. We ask you to pray. We ask you to care. Now, Jesus managed... There's so many things I find myself repeating over the years. Hopefully, they become memorable. Jesus could care for 12 people. None of us as good as Jesus. So I would invite you to go for less than 12. Somewhere between 2 and 10. Most of us settle on about 5 or 6, 7 people. People who you care for. What I mean by that is that you look out for them. You phone them up to see how they are. You message them. You pray for them. If they're not here... Any week, you go out and find out what's wrong. If they need a lift or food or advice, you're there for them because you've committed into them. They may be someone from your small group. They may be somebody you've known forever. They may be somebody you've invited. If you're short of ideas, you always sit in the same place. Look at the people who you're sitting near and get to know them. When we have tea and coffee, get to know some people. They may be part of the activity that you're in. But would you just make it your thing to care? One of the things that Dan and I discuss on occasions is when people say to us, the church hasn't done anything for us. And uh, what will often happen is we might ask the question, has anybody been to see you? And they will give us a list of people from the church who has been to see them. And we will think, Dan, Dan and I will think, the church has cared for them. Only they didn't realize it was the church because it was their friends. And what people often mean when they say the church doesn't care for them is they mean Donald didn't care for them. Well, I can't manage more than 10 people. So if we're going to care as a church, and Dan can't manage more than 10 people, if we're going to care as a church, we break it down into caring each of us for some people. I think all of us can do those three things. Live authentically, pray, and care. Fourth one might be only if you are able, but we really would invite you to commit regularly to give to the work that we do. We can do that on our website, tell you how to do it. We've got challenges. By the grace of God, we are still here. By the grace of God, we're not in debt. We want to uh, build our staff team as people uh, like Kath and like Sarah are moving on, we want to uh, bring new people in. To do that, we need to know what our giving is. We need to know that it's pretty well the same or growing every month. Not randomly what people have remembered when they've got time and money left over, but something that's committed to us. If you're able to do that, you build the church. Lots of us aren't able to work the hours that some of us on the staff team do. But by enabling us to, by giving you, enable us to have that time. Fifth thing that you may be able to do, while you're all doing it tonight, is attending. Please don't underestimate the value of you simply being in the room. I tell you what, church is absolutely rubbish if it's just me and one other person, because they've got to hear me sing and I am dreadful. But tonight, when you were singing, you are building the church. When you come with thanksgiving, you build the church. When you smile to someone who walks in the door, you build the church. When you talk to somebody near you, you build the church. When you stay and chat after the service till, till nine, half past nine, you build the church. When you go to Ignite, you build the church. When you go to Boys and Girls Brigade, you build the church. When you go to this small group, you build the church simply by being there because of the encouragement of seeing others. Now, I know that there are, what often happens with a lot of people is they will think, shall I go to church tonight? Tell you what I'll do. I'll ask A, B, or C, are you going to church tonight? Because it is hard to walk in on your own. But can you be the person that goes, yep, I'm going. Whether you guys come with me or not, I'll be there. 
Because what happens is when we know, oh, we know Donald's going to be there, other people come. Don't be the person that says, I'll only go if you're going. Be the person that says, I'm going, will you come with me? Because you build the church. Sixthly, invite. If you are able to invite someone, it may be that you're able able to invite them to Christmas. Not every week. You do it when it's appropriate. Don't do it when it's embarrassing. That is not authentic living. Wait for the moment. We talked about that before, but wait for the right moment and you invite. You say, would you come with me to Christmas? Would you come to me for this special event, this quiz night that we're doing? Would you come with me on a Sunday? Just come and see what we do. Come to our youth and children's activities. Come to all aboard. Come to Ladies Fellowship. And perhaps, and my prayer as I've said this, is that all of you will have the opportunity to say to somebody, will you come with me to Alpha? Most of the people who come and stay in Alpha come because somebody else comes with them and just says, I'm going, I'll come, I'll take you. Because it is hard to walk into the building on your own. Now, it may not be this year that you get to invite someone, but if you're praying and if you're living, at some point, somebody that you know will have a conversation with you about what you are about, and I pray you have the courage to say, come with me. And lastly, if you have time and if you're able, join with us in serving. If you're newish to the church, join with us on living the life and come and find out all the different things that we're about and our values and how to get involved and how to serve. If you've been part of the church for a long time and you've got time now, you've got time to do something in the week or on a Sunday. You've got time to be out doing the car park or to serve tea and coffee or to welcome or to get involved in worship or whatever it is. Come and talk to me or to Georgie on the desk. I want to stress that it's the least important of those seven things. Roughly, they are in the order of importance. In other words, if you're not able, because the job that you do, and so it takes all your energy, that is what you're doing for Jesus. Do that. And don't worry that you can't get involved in something else. If you do the other six, perfect. It's not what we do in the building. It's the other six that we do outside the building. They built the wall with loads of different people. Did you get that from chapter 3? All those different people. Some of them were zealous. Some of them had to do the poo gate. All kinds of different people. And God is inviting us to build the church. Some of us will say, it's not my skill set. One to six, I don't care what your skill set is, but you can do one to six at some point if your finances allow and your health allows. I'm going to invite you to join with me in a prayer, and Noah's going to lead us uh, prayerfully in responding uh, together. So as Noah and the team come and join me on the screen is a prayer. So one of the things we do at the call to prayer, which you're all now going to subscribe to and watch through the week, uh, five minutes at a time, one of the things we often do is what we, where we encourage and invite people to say bits of a prayer. Commonly, uh, it's in the yellow. So I'm going to invite you, if these are words that you identify with, whether for this church or another church that you're part of, because we, we delight that uh, in our services we have friends from other churches who come uh, to be built up, and that's absolutely brilliant. And um, those seven things apply to the church that you're committed to. So maybe that you want to pray this prayer very much for your church. But if these words are words that you want to buy into, that you want to roll up your sleeves, pull up your socks, tuck in your tunic, whatever it is, and say, I want to build the church. I want to love, and I want to pray. I'm going to invite you to say these yellow words with me. It goes over several slides, and then we will go into a prayer that we'll sing together. So would you stand with me? So 
So I'll read over you the words in white, but if you read with me the words in yellow. Saving God, we renew our desire to partner with you in making disciples. Fill us with your spirit that we might be a blessing to the world. May we love as you loved. Help us to behave as you did. Strengthen us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you daily. Help us to believe in your salvation and to trust your unfailing love and turn from our sin. Show us how to help others believe. Refill our baptistry and trust us with those who are being saved. Help us to build community and develop relationships with those who are lost or seeking that they may feel they belong and have someone to show them the love and life of Jesus. Saving God, we renew our desire to partner with you in making disciples. Fill us with your spirit that we might be a blessing to the world. We renew our commitment to your church. We will live authentically, pray persistently, care consistently, give graciously, attend regularly, invite sensitively, and serve where able for your glory. Amen. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out.